Um, okay, and then Eric Erickson, another neo Freudian who's best known for the psychosocial stages of development. So he modified and extended Freud's psychosexual stages of development. Um, Erickson said that he believed these were not only changes Freud would have approved of, but also ones he would have made himself had he lived long enough. Um, but of course, he's focusing on personality development across the lifespan, okay, which is one major way in which he differs from Freud. He's not saying that personality is developed by early middle childhood. He's saying it continues to develop as one gets older. But also he put more focus on the ego and um, believed that people were more conscious um, than Freud did. Freud describes the relationship between the ego and the id using the analogy of a horse and a rider. And so he says the horse is the it and the, the rider um, is the eagle. And so a well, um, you know, a, 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 a particular uh, rider could rein in the, the horse, could rein in the it and control it. But ultimately, it's still the mercy of, of the it. It's the it who contains the true power. Uh, whereas Erickson didn't agree with this, Erickson believed that the ego has power of its own and as one gets older, it, it grows in strength. And then he recognized the importance of culture as well. And I'll talk um, in more detail by giving some examples of what I mean by this, but he really argued that his theory could <laughs> look through the lens of the context in which it's being applied, okay? Because the application of it will differ from culture to culture, depending upon what's valued in that society. And so Erickson was born in Frankfurt, Germany, 1902. The son of a Jewish mother, he didn't know his father. Um, his mother left him before the wedding, and then she married his Peter Trippin. And um, he grew up not knowing that this wasn't his biological father. Um, it wasn't until early adulthood that he found out it wasn't. And then when he moved to America, he changed his name. Um, but he says in childhood, he really had no self-identity. He didn't know who he was. There wasn't anyone around him he could identify with. Um, he was Jewish. His mother was Jewish. Um, Anti-Semitism was high, so he was not accepted by his German peers. But also his um, father was Scandinavian, his biological father. So he was pale-skinned and blonde and had Nordic features. And so he didn't feel as though he belonged within the Jewish community either. Um, he performed pretty mediocrely at school. But one thing he really was interested in was art. And so he left home at 18 to become an artist. And so he really fell into psychology just by happenstance, okay? It just so happened that a friend of his um, recommended a job that was going at the Psychoanalytic Institute in Vienna. They were looking for someone just to keep the kids busy while the adults were undergoing therapy. And so he took the job and he gave the children art lessons while the um, parents were in therapy. Um, but Anna Freud observed his sensitivity to the children and she thought he could make a good child psychologist. And this was a field that she was just developing. And so she trained Erickson uh, in child psychology. And then he received a diploma from the um, Psychoanalytic Institute in Vienna. But a diploma is what he had okay he never had an academic degree of any kind and uh, he did later on try his phd but he failed in the first year but even despite not having academic degrees he still was very successful in his career and he fled to Denmark once the germans took power in germany and then once the nazis occupied denmark he fled to america he took a research assistant job at harvard and then in 1950, he published a very well-received book called Childhood and Society, which extends Freud's stages of development and modifies them. And you know, a book that still holds up today, you can find it easily online if you're interested. Uh, but this was so well-received that even despite not having a degree, um, he got a job as a professor teaching human development courses at Yale and then at Harvard. 
and then he passed away in 94 at the age of 91. Okay, so remember in psychodynamic theory, the ego is the source of consciousness. And so for Erickson, this is where one's self identity is formed. And he believes there were three aspects to this. First of all, how do you view your physical appearance? Are there any um, physicalities that make you um, insecure? How do you think you compare to others? How do you view yourself physically? And this is uh, referred to as uh, the body ego. Uh, the ego ideal. So who do you want to be? How do you want to be perceived? What do you want out of life? What's your dream? What's your ambitions? How do you want to interact with people? And then ego identity, which is the various social roles that you might identify with. So, you know, being a mother, a father, a son, husband, friends, girlfriend, whatever it is, you have particular roles that you identify with, which are part of your ego identity. But the ego emerges from, and is largely shaped uh, by culture. <laughs> and again, I will give some examples when we talk about the stages of term, in terms of how culture can have an impact. Okay, so, the psychosocial stages of development you're likely familiar with from intro to psych or a development course, but hopefully I can still um, give you some new insight into it. Um, but first of all is the oral sensory stage, which of course runs parallel to Freud's oral stage. It happens between the first two years in life. But for Erickson, there is a conflict arising at each stage. And so this stage is the trust versus mixed trust stage. Is the world a reliable and dependable place? Can I trust the world or is it not to be trusted? And so clearly at the extreme, if a child is abused or neglected, they will view the world as not being trusted. But even less extreme than that, if the parent isn't responsive to their needs, if they don't believe the parent is dependable, then they may also view the world as not being trusted. So again, this is very, very similar to attachment theory, right? It's almost identical. John Bowlby said that there is a critical period during the first two years in which the child must identify the parent as a um, safe base. And if this doesn't happen, you might have an insecure um, attachment style. And so if this is resolved successfully, a basic strength is emerged, okay, which then um, forms part of the ego. And so the feeling of hope here um, is the basic strength that would emerge. Now, in every conflict, there should be some experience of both opposites, okay? You don't know um, how to resolve being hungry if you never experience being hungry, but also the child shouldn't be overfed. Otherwise, they will think every need they ever had will always be immediately um, responded to. So some distress is natural and should be experienced. But of course, the balance should tilt in favor of trust. Okay. Uh, the muscular anal stage, of course, running parallel to Freud's anal stage between two and three, when the child is beginning to exercise some will perhaps saying no to some demands complying with other demands of course toilet training here is the main event will the child be encouraged or will they be made to feel embarrassed and shamed anytime they have an accident will they be ridiculed um for any sort of mistake in which case they might not have a sense of autonomy so again if there's success with resolution Will is the basic strength then that emerges. And the locomotor genital stage running parallel, of course, to Freud's phallic stage between three and five. But for Freud, for Ericsson, rather, this is really where the child <coughs> develops self esteem. Okay, they begin to have ideas of their own, they begin to tell stories, they begin to suggest games and ideas. 
will those um, ideas and games, will they be seen as entertaining by those around them? Will they be well received or will they be ridiculed and made to feel um, as though they're stupid or not um, coming up with good ideas? And so the conflict here is initiative versus guilt. And if it's resolved successfully, then a sense of purpose is the strength that emerges. And then latency stage, of course, parallel to Freud's latency stage between six and 11. This is when the child begins challenging schoolwork, okay? But also they might try out different sports and so on. Will they find something they're good at or will they be made to feel inferior because they're not as competent as others? And um, so, a sense of industriousness, a sense of motivation is the positive outcome here that should be favoured, um, whereas inferiority would be the disfavourable outcome. And if it's a favourable outcome, then competence is the basic strength that's emerged. Okay, and then as one begins their teenage years, which according to Freud, remember, is the final stage, the genital stage, but Erickson calls it adolescence. Um, one here is trying to um, find their role identity. Okay, so separating themselves from the parents, from the family home. Who are they actually? What's their political opinions? What's their religious views? What are they interested in? What's their opinions of the world? And what do they actually want to do for life? What's their identity? And um, some role confusion here would be normal, okay, in terms of how you want to be perceived by others, what you want to do with your life. You know, teenagers might try out different roles and then ultimately find one that they identify with and it might take some time. Um, but the um, conflict in the end should be favourable in terms of the um, self-identity being formed. Um, Young adulthood. Now, we're getting to a point when the age brackets shouldn't be employed um, rigidly, okay? And in fact, they differ from source to source, but they're just generalizations, okay? Of course, one might find love um, before 30, one might find love well after 30, but this is just a kind of general rough guide. So don't take these you know, too seriously for any case studies, for example. But um, this is where one is trying to seek acceptance and comfort um, and belonging and intimacy with a partner, which is based upon mutual love and mutual respect. Um, the alternative is isolation. Again, some isolation is normal and healthy, so you can better understand yourself and who you really are. Um, but ultimately, it should be favoured towards um, intimacy, and if that's the case, then a feeling of love will be generated. Um, and then adulthood is um, generativity versus stagnation. What Erickson really meant here in terms of stagnation is self-centeredness, only focusing on your needs, whereas generativity refers to a need or a desire to reproduce and then care for the offspring but also more broadly, care for society and want to leave the world a better place than how you found it. So if that's the case, then the basic strength is care, care for um, other people other than yourself. But again, a degree of self-centeredness is normal and necessary, so you can work on yourself. and uh, You shouldn't overextend yourself to others, but, but obviously the conflict should favor um, generativity. And then old age is the final stage, um, ego integrity, which is asking the question, am I satisfied with who I am and what I've done in life versus despair if you're consumed by regret? Now, obviously, a degree of regret would be normal in old age. You probably didn't make all the right decisions, but it shouldn't overwhelm you. Overall, the um, conflict should tilt into being happy with who you are. And if that's the case, a feeling of wisdom is the basic strength which emerges. I should say, Erickson characterizes this final stage as being very positive and optimistic, but when he reached old age, he found that the final years of his life were his most depressing and 
he believed that there was actually a ninth stage, uh, an additional stage after this, which was old, old age, in which um, deterioration was the main characterization. It was a less positive life experience. And he did begin a manuscript that would be an addition to this book that would include this final stage, but ultimately he passed away before the manuscript was finished. And so this final stage was never added. Okay, so some rules. This developmental rule follows the endogenetic principle, meaning that one component doesn't replace another. So it's not the case that once you've generated a feeling of competence, that that's eradicated hope and will. Okay, and it's not the case that one is dependent upon the other. You know, if you don't resolve the first stage successfully, it's not then the case that you're destined to. Um, uh, have a negative outcome for every subsequent stage. You can unsuccessfully resolve the second stage, but then still successfully resolve later stages. But it is the case, according to Erickson, that earlier positive resolution makes later resolutions more likely to be positive. Okay, So it's easier to develop a sense of purpose and competence if you've developed successfully a feeling of hope and will. Otherwise, it will be difficult, but not impossible. But also, Erickson believes that people have a degree of free will over who they are and consciousness over their conflicts. But obviously, this increases with age, right? The first stage is largely occurring unconsciously. The child isn't thinking, is the world to be trusted or not trusted? This is completely unconscious in which this is occurring. But as the child gets older, the conflicts will become more and more conscious. And they will have more and more free will over the resolutions of the conflicts as well. So the first stage, you know, really is completely dependent upon the parents, right? The, the children have very little direct influence themselves on the resolution of this. But as they get older, they will have more and more um, active role to play in terms of the resolution. So as you've seen, every stage has an interaction of opposites. Syntonic here, referring to harmonious. Dystonic, referring to disruptive. So obviously, the syntonic one is the positive side. So identity in, uh, instead of confusion. Generativity instead of stagnation. And obviously, the balance should tilt in favor of the syntonic elements, okay, the positive or harmonious. Element. Um, conflict between the two produces evil strength. Ideally, if the conflict is not successfully resolved, then a core pathology is developed instead, an opposite of the evil strength, which will lead to maladevelopmental tendencies later in life. And I'll give you the examples of these on the next slide. Now, importantly, Erickson said the resolution of these conflicts is de dependent upon environmental experiences, but they are biological in nature. Okay, so he believes that there was a you know biological um, roadmap, if you like, that this would be the series of conflicts that take place one after the other, um, and so there was a biological basis to this. But in terms of how they're actually resolved. That's due to social factors. <clears throat> so the core pathology that can develop in the first stage if hope doesn't develop is withdrawal. Withdrawing from the world, this can lead to maladaptive tendencies of depression and paranoia later in life. And compulsion is the core pathology if um, will is not developed, so somewhat similar to the anal character type in Freud's theory, um, and constant need for perfectionism. Um, inhibition, if not purpose, so a, a, a fear of um, failure, so not, not trying, not putting yourself forward because you're too afraid to fail. If you don't develop a Feeling of competence, then you might develop an inferiority complex, feeling as though you're not um, um, 
equal to others, and so you don't have the same sense of industriousness and motivation that you would otherwise. And you completely reject the need for an identity together if you don't successfully form a self identity. And if you don't have love um, successfully resolved, then you will isolate yourself. And this core pathology is exclusivity. If you don't have care for others, so if you're stuck in stagnation, too self centered, then you won't contribute to society. And then if you don't have um, wisdom, if you don't have um, ego integrity, so you aren't content with who you were and what you've done in life, you will be consumed by disdain and contempt for life. Now, these were the original eight core pathologies that Erickson developed. Um, but much, much later in his career, he came up with eight additional core pathologies, which makes sense, okay, because it's a conflict with two extremes, and he said that either extreme is not ideal. So it makes sense that there would be a core pathology corresponding to each extreme. Um, so these are the additional eight that he added. You know, personally, I think some of the labels are a bit off, but anyway. Um, he describes sensory maladjustment as being overly trusting. Um, shameless willfulness, so impulsivity, okay, just doing what you want without any regard for consequences. Ruthlessness, um, so this person is taking initiative, but without any regard for others. Um, Erickson says that this could lead to one being a sociopath. If you've taken my forensic psych course, you know we haven't used that term in about 100 years. We use the term psychopath or antisocial personality disorder. But I think what Erickson really meant was um, not feeling any guilt or remorse for, for others. Okay, so you just do what you want. Um, and the latency stage, um, a, a narrow view of one's life so Erickson gives the examples of child actors and uh, child gymnasts and children who are completely dedicating all of their time to one pursuit and so and every other aspect have no life. Um, the extreme identity, the extreme opposite, sorry, of no identity is being a fanatic. So latching on too extremely to one particular identity so much so that you become a fanatic. Um, overextension then is a simple one, the opposite of exclusivity, overextending yourself to others, not giving yourself any focus whatsoever, no self-centeredness at all, not giving any room for growth or um, personal space. And then the final one is presumption, which is really a, a feeling of or a state of denial, okay, in which one doesn't um, take into account some of the limitations that might come with old age, okay? And so they just presume that they are still the same um, healthy person that's competent in every way that they were before without taking any acknowledgement of the um, consequences that might come with age development. <coughs> um, any questions on the, the four pathologies or the conflicts? Uh, now, Erickson is also well known for developing play therapy. He observed emotionally disturbed children and emotionally healthy children to see if healthy play was different. Um, and indeed, this is now a standardized tool, right? Um, abused children, for example, often behave more violently and roughly with other children, but also with toys and dolls. Um, and so this is one way of um, observing to see if there might be any issues at home in and psychology and counseling. Um, so this was part of how he came up with his maladaptive tendencies and positive um, tendencies. But also he believed in studying different cultures and he spent time with some Native American communities in the US. What he really wanted to observe was 
was the developmental stages universal. Now he believed, or concluded based upon what he saw, that the stages themselves didn't have a universal element because there is a biological basis to their progression. But how they actually play out will differ from culture to culture depending upon what's valued. So the latency stage, you know, Erickson says a big component of this for um, you know, Westerners and for America is um, how one performs at school. Do they find that, um, that they are competent at schoolwork? Do they find a sport that they're good at? Or do they feel inferior to peers? But of course, this is what's valued by our culture, right? So that will dictate how one sees themselves in terms of being competent or in incompetent. Um, so, you know, if you're from a rural community in Africa, then um, the, the, the skills that matter to that community are to do with survival, right? Um, and so that's the skills um, that will be valued by that community. And if one is able to successfully use those skills, then they might have a feeling of competence. If they don't, then they might have a feeling of inferiority. But obviously what's valued, what's important to that culture, what's important to that land, um, will dictate what's valued and so how the conflict will um, um, live out. <clears throat> and Erickson also put together biographies of famous historical figures ranging from Martin Luther to um, Adolf Hitler to Gandhi to Thomas Jefferson. And he concluded that they were in part product of their time. So what's valued is not only a consequence of culture, but also of time. But also he believed that positive behaviors could be traced back to positive developments or positive resolution of the conflicts. Whereas those who were more negative, so Hitler, for example, he could trace back to examples of um, negative resolution of the conflicts and core pathologies being developed so inferiority for example instead of competence and this in part could perhaps explain later either positive or negative behaviors and and you know some of these are interesting reads if you're interesting if you're interested there's uh, multiple books by Erickson on this in which he shows how the developmental stages can be um, applied to particular historical figures Okay, so overall, Erickson's view of people is pretty positive and optimistic. People have increasingly more and more free will as they get older over who they are, are more and more conscious as they get older over the conflicts that they're experiencing. So the impacts, play therapy is now a standard tool. The concept of the identity crisis, if one doesn't have good role identity, is now a well-used term. He appreciates both biological and cultural factors. And then there is some evidence, particularly the importance of trust in infants for um, successful emotional development, which remember has some um, overlap with attachment findings. The secure attachments will predict later positive um, secure relationships and more positive um, social development outcomes. Um, the textbook, if you have it, goes into quite a bit of detail over some of the um, evidence that's been gathered. But you know, some of it's not very surprising that there's benefits associated with hope and with will and the other ego strengths that he came up with. But one interesting finding by researchers is that the ego strengths are correlated with one another. So if one is higher in hope, they're more likely to have will and more likely to have confidence and purpose. So that adds to the validity of Erickson's argument that um, earlier positive outcomes lead to um, later positive outcomes, or at least it's easier to generate later positive outcomes. But the, the fact that they're correlated with one another would support this. <laughs> he inspired the field of lifespan development and um, so most psychology programs now have a lifespan development course. Um, you know, psychologists have no longer focused only on early childhood. 
and then recognition of historical influences. Um, some negatives. He employed the case study approach mostly, so same criticisms that we gave to Freud and Jung and Adler. And um, some ambiguous terms and concepts. Now, some of the ego strengths are pretty vague in, in name. Um, little precision, therefore, in terms of how these might be empirically tested. Some would argue it's more descriptive than explanatory. Um, and then also an incomplete description of maturity since he didn't get to finalizing the final stage that we have in mind. 